You're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. I'm Al. And I'm Sarah. And it's winter, and we're still planning for the spring to arrive. We've had, like, some pretty amazingly weird weather this week where it rained and snowed and rained again. But there's no snow anymore, and there's some green stuff out there in the world that looks like gardening plant material, but it's still too early to do a lot of the things that we really, really want to do. So we're going to discuss this week what you can do. And what you should hold off and wait before you do. Yes. So I guess like it's still too early to go out there and start digging around, but you can winter sow some some things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you think about uh, the beds that are out there, there's definitely green perennial things starting to come up. A lot of plants uh, have little tiny green shoots showing and the bulbs are all showing their, their stems. So it's pretty neat to see that things are definitely alive and they're starting, but uh, it, things move really slowly this time of year. That's what I find. It feels like spring could happen tomorrow and all the crocuses could go into bloom, but that's not going to be for a couple of weeks. So we really just need to be patient and chill out and, and let nature sort of take its time. We often find in the spring, if we go to Halifax, it's probably at least a week ahead of Sackville. Yeah, and I mean, I find in the spring, it's so obvious where you're at because there are so many spring blooms that... Uh, are so beautiful and uh, so remarkable. Things like forsythia or the magnolia flowers or earlier on you have crocuses and snowdrops coming out. So when you see those things, you know that's like a marker of the day of spring. So when should we expect to see crocuses and like snowdrops? Like Well, snowdrops probably are coming out any time. Uh, and then, I mean, they're called snowdrops, so they come out when there's still snow on the ground. It's amazing that we don't have snow on the ground in Sackville or in Halifax right now, because that's pretty uh, uncommon. Last year, we had definitely still snow till the beginning of April, at least in like the shady areas, but right now it's pretty clear. Um, but we could still get some bad weather. That's the thing about this time of year, is you don't want to start clearing things away from your garden and exposing all the plants because we still could get a really cold weekend or we could get a snowstorm. You never know. Yeah, and it is a good time of year to start pruning perennials and fruit trees um, for their their winter pruning. I usually like to err on the side of waiting. Like Now is a good time to probably start, but I always want to wait until after there's a risk of an ice storm because I find it, it, it's really disappointing to go out and prune your trees and get them looking how you really want them to look for spring and then have an ice storm and lose a lot of branches. It's better to lose those branches and repair as you're pruning for you know, your early spring pruning Definitely. to wait too long. Yeah, and I find pruning is one of those things that people uh, always find fairly mystifying. Like it feels like it's really complicated and there's right ways and wrong ways to do it. And in some cases that's true, but really the best thing to do when you prune is just to go out and remove any damaged branches or damaged pieces of wood and then also anything that's already dead. And even if that's all you do for pruning is take out anything that's been hit by uh, an ice storm or that's died back, uh, that's, that's going to be a lot of the way towards keeping your plants healthy. So Absolutely. yeah, exactly. You don't want to be doing that and then having more damage and then you end up removing more of the plant than you want or maybe in a spot where you don't want to do it. Yeah, a little can go a long way. I mean, when you get confident, I mean, it's so easy to start pruning a tree and then over prune it. Um, it's better to just leave them alone in a lot of cases, but pruning does help, especially if you're looking for uh, fruit, lots of fruit. So you should prune if you're looking for fruit. And there are definitely lots of information out there about how to do it. And we won't get into that on today's podcast, but it is about the time of year when you should be going out with your loppers and looking at the damage that your perennial fruit trees and shrubs experienced over the winter and starting to remove some of those dead branches. Things are still dormant, even though they're about to come out of dormancy, it's going to be still a couple of weeks before that happens. And then there's like, a, there's also a tendency to want to clean up the, the leaf litter and things that have fallen 
onto your beds, but you would recommend against that. There's more and more garden information out there about protecting pollinators and protecting habitat in your garden. And it really, when I first learned about gardening from people, the sort of thing that everybody did was really clean up the perennial beds in the fall and cut back all of the stems and and then that became uh, really obvious that that was harming pollinating insects and that pollinating insects are so important. I mean, all insects are really important to our ecosystems and to our world. So, and now the sort of, uh, I'd say the benchmark there is people say, don't clean up the leaf litter in your gardens, in your perennial gardens until the temperatures are, are uh, above 10 degrees during the day. So, I mean, that's gonna be a little while. Uh, we, we're going to get 10 degree days. We've already had a few, but to have them consistently where you're not getting also those like minus one, minus twos. Uh, and the reason for that is that a lot of like, for, I was learning about bumblebees the other day and a lot of bumblebees are actually nesting in that leaf litter and they're waiting for the spring to come. But if you disturb them too early, then they're going to potentially die in the cold. So just giving them that little bit of extra time. And it's, it's hard to say when that 10 degree is going to happen, but that would be end of April, beginning of May. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, I think that really I don't clear out that much leaf litter from around my perennials. Like I'll move it a little bit around from plants that are emerging that are coming up. Like if you have a big like oregano plant and you can tell that it's trying to grow new leaves and it's growing it through like, you know, three or four inches of leaf, you can clear that away a little bit, but don't go and rake out your whole bed. That's really what's going to destroy the, the insect habitat. And if you're interested in uh, finding out where is spring right now, uh, I've become uh, really interested in checking out the American Phenology Society. And they have a website with various maps on it that show where spring actually is at this point. And they based where spring is geographically on first leaf appearance and blooms. Yeah, phenology is a really cool concept that people are getting more interested in as the climate is changing because it used to be that really there were benchmarks according to dates that could be followed really pretty consistently every year. Even like, you know, a lot of people use like the moon cycles and say the first full moon in June, they would plant out their gardens, their vegetable gardens. Um, so things like that were, were very consistent over the years, but now as the climate's changing, they're becoming less and less consistent. And so people are spending more time uh, tracking them and figuring out uh, how they're changing, where they're changing fast, where they're changing slower, and how that's impacting wildlife and insect populations. Yeah, I looked at their their graphical map uh, before the show today, and spring is currently like in New, like as far north as New York City. Okay. And so that's pretty close, but it kind of gets to New York City pretty fast. And it's just like, it doesn't come up like the whole of the southern United States. It comes really up that eastern seaboard. Right, and where so there's it's just mountainous a, in the interior. So uh, Yeah, there's, so there's a sliver of spring that comes up all the way up to New York City and Long Island. And then it can take quite a long time to get from there to where we are. Definitely. And you mentioned there um, the first moon in June. When is that this year? And is that a good time to wait? Well, I just looked that up and it's not until June 21st. So I would say if you waited until June 21st, that's going to be quite late to like put out your tomatoes and peppers and your heat loving plants. That's usually the marker. People really want to have a date where they're really sure there's going to be no frost. They can put things out without protection and they're going to grow really well from then on. Some people say May 2, 4 weekend. Uh, other people go by the last frost date, which in Halifax is probably May, May 10th. And here it's more like May 15th to 20th. Uh, and so those, that's a whole month. Between... I know that's a whole month. It's very variable. Uh, but I think it's, it's hard to tell. Maybe this year we're going to have a really late frost in June. I, I can think of a couple of years ago, we had one June 6th, June 5th, a couple of years before that. So that's pretty late, but I mean, you usually only get one night that has a frost and hopefully if you're a small scale gardener or grower, you can go out and throw a bed sheet over your plants with some you know, hoops or water jugs to protect them. So you, you just need to monitor that and have a way to protect them if you do get a frost. But we're still a ways away from worrying about our plants getting hit in a late frost because 
it's still below zero every day. It's true. <laughs> but, I, but I find I'm thinking a lot about what's going to happen and trying to figure it out because when you're planting seeds, which is what most gardeners are doing this time of year, if you're growing your own transplants, whether it's flowers or vegetables, you're, you're you know, buying seeds, planting seeds, getting them all ready. You're timing all of that on the last frost date. So all of your seed packages say six to eight weeks before last frost, three to four weeks, 10 to So weeks. is it too late to be buying seeds? No, not at all. And is it too late to plant seeds? No. Okay. So are you still in the process of buying seeds? I think I've bought all of the seeds that I need. I bought some from a couple of really awesome local uh, seed companies this year. Uh, Revival Seeds in Nova Scotia, Incredible Seeds, and Yonder Hill Seeds. Uh, they all have really great catalogs. Oh, and Annapolis Seeds in the Valley. Really great catalogs with really interesting uh, different kinds of varieties, a lot of heritage varieties to the Maritimes, which is something that we're really interested in growing here in the garden. So uh, I wanted to order them early because a lot of times those smaller seed companies will sell out of certain varieties, and I wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So I ordered them uh, last month and then you could still order them now. They're very fast. I ordered some microgreen seeds from incredible seeds the other day and they arrived in three days, like in the Canada post mail. So even the little seed companies are really good at shipping out this time of year and getting them to you very quickly. So then how, like, so I order some seeds from a local seed company and I get them. Do I, should I plant them right away? Or should I wait on it? Like, how do you know when to plant? Because like so often plant something like a tomato and it just gets too big and leggy and falls over. And then you go to the home center and you see a beautiful tomato plant that was grown somewhere far away. And it looks so much better that you just end up putting that one in anyway. Yeah, I think... Well, you want to look at your seed packages and look to resources that you might have and find out how long you should plant before last frost. So I sort of think about plants in a couple of different categories. There's the really heat loving plants, and those are the ones that people often really love to grow inside. So those are like tomatoes and eggplants and peppers, uh, okra, melons. So those are ones that you're going to be planting outside, but only after that magical last frost date, whenever that is. And you can go by the one that's given to you by your hardiness zone, or like we were saying, you can sort of wing it more with what the local environment feels like and just be aware that you may have to run out and protect them at different points. So right now we're eight weeks off of what's considered our last frost date. So I would say tomatoes, they say six to eight weeks. So anytime, I haven't actually planted my tomatoes yet. I'm holding off this year because I, I find, like you said, I do them too early and they get laggy. And I'd rather put smaller plants that are really robust and healthy into the greenhouse and into the garden. And then they take off really fast, then put ones that are sort of a little bit on the edge into the garden. Yeah, I think there, another challenge in that is like the, the concept of hardening off. So you want to put your plants outside to expose them to wind and uh, rain and cooler cooler temperatures. But if they're leggy and weak, uh, they don't survive that very well. It actually makes them go get even worse, where if you have like nice, small, robust ones and you put them out in that environment, they quickly adapt and start to take off. Yeah, and I, I feel like hardening off is something that I... I will admit I do not do that good of a job of doing every year, and I will say I will try to do a fantastic job of it this year, always. One of my goals is to take hardening off more seriously because it can be really cumbersome to be carrying plants inside and outside. You know, a lot of the people will say to bring them outside for like an hour and then bring them in and then bring them outside for like three hours and then bring them in. But like, Oh my That's God, <laughs> you're spending like your whole day, like with a timer moving your tomato plants in and out. And I mean, if you've got like, you know, four or five flats of plants, it's like a bit. And we also, we also pot up a bunch of herbs and other plants over the winter. So we have things like uh, rosemary and sage and avocado and, curry tree and all these different things that we bring in over the winter 
and then we have to take them out in the spring and not have them lose all their leaves and we have to figure out and we have all these fig trees now yeah. as well so i think that this year we'll build a special hardening off area that is kind of easy to um i just find the the, the thing that i always get trapped with is putting things out and having them get sunburned and then they leave, yeah. lose their leaves that they had all over the winter. They'll often recover from that, but it sort of defeats the purpose of keeping them inside. Definitely. It sets them back. Yeah. So a better hardening off. So having somewhere that's sheltered, that has less direct sunlight and less wind would be really helpful. But that is warm because often the spots in the yard that are in the shade that protect um, the leaves from U ultraviolet light are in cooler areas so yeah, yeah there's and, a challenge and right. this is actually a great time of year to go out in your garden and look for those microclimates uh, because in any garden or yard there's going to be a real variation in where the soil is going to warm up first in the spring where the wind uh, has more impact on the plants also where the snow collects and the last places that the snow melts so looking at uh, looking at those areas and then thinking about where you're going to plant things or if you're going to move move different plants or if you want to build raised beds looking at where the snow melts first and where it gets the most direct sun um, and just thinking about about what kind of microclimates you might have and you if you want to do that and you don't have any snow left but it's still pretty cold out you can just take a spade and walk around and see Oh, yeah. Plunk it down and see where it, it, it's frozen still, as opposed to areas where the spade will sink an inch or two into the ground. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good idea. Yeah, so seeds, I guess, starting tomatoes anytime, starting those heat-loving crops, you can do that starting soon. Uh, but then also there's the cold-hardy crops, and I'm going to start those ones soon. I've already started some green onions and... That's about it, actually. I really only started green onions because those ones can go out in the garden earlier. And we do have some things in our unheated greenhouse. That's true, too. So we have spinach and claytonia. Do you right. want to talk about claytonia for a moment? Yeah, claytonia is a really amazing plant. I actually just saw some photos of somebody who was collecting it in Arizona where it grows wild. And it was pretty cool just to see these big patches. It's, it's a succulent plant almost, like it has uh, sort of thicker leaves and it's very, very mild and sweet tasting. But it looks like lettuce. It kind looks of. kind of like lettuce. It has sort of heart-shaped leaves and it's neat because it grows from like a central point. So it's almost like a little, uh, a little octopus or something. Or an explosion. A little explosion. And then it also has uh, little beautiful white flowers. And I got some seed for Claytonia a lot of years ago from Open Sky Farm here in Sackville because they always had it growing in their greenhouse. And I planted some, and every year it just grows all over the greenhouse. It's almost like it's gone wild self-seeding in there. And even in years where I bring in soil or really dig up the greenhouse, it still manages to germinate all over the place. The seeds just self-seed like wild. It's actually kind of like a crazy weed, it but is. you can eat it. But it's and delicious. It would be unacceptable in the greenhouse or the garden, except for the fact that it grows really well when there's nothing else growing. Yeah. So it gets a pass on being like invasive. It's not invasive, but it's like... It's persistent, persistent, definitely. Yeah. It's on the, and the other reason that I, I don't mind it self-seeding and taking over is that it's really easy to pull up. Like, it hardly has any root system, and you can just grab the, grab the base of the plant and pull it up really easily, and that's it. It doesn't grow again from that spot that year. It's really the self-seeding. And I could keep it from seeding by cutting it down before it goes to flower, but I don't want to do that. And I want it there. From a chef's perspective, it's, it's awesome because it's a really nice attractive little in, in uh green and it will take on a red tinge as it gets exposed to more light as the days get longer and yeah it's a uh, fantastic um to have and yeah i really appreciate it coming up early and giving us something fresh from the garden to use yeah and i find it's interesting because uh although most plants that are cold hardy tend to be on the spicy side like mustard greens it's really sweet and uh, has a nice flavor and it's cool looking like from when it's really tiny until when it's really quite large like you can 
you can just use it like the whole plant, wash it and just sit it down. And it's like this little explosion of green. It's uh yeah, it's good. And then we also have spinach growing. Yeah. So the spinach we planted in the fall from seed and also from transplants and it's, it's growing slowly. It's, it's getting there. And then I seeded a bunch of mustard and some arugula in there as well. And so that's, that's growing as well, slowly. Sometimes as a gardener, you have to make sacrifices. So this year we renovated uh, the interior of our greenhouse and we raised some beds in there and uh, updated, made the soil better. And in order to do that, we planted our winter spinach way later than we did in the previous two years. So we do not have as much as we wish we had, but that's something that you have to make those hard choices when you're gardening. Uh, the year before we did, well, actually in the last few years, We've totally re-landscaped our garden that's behind our restaurant, and we've had to like make some sacrifices, like move all of our raspberry and blackberry bushes. So when you do that, you are not going to get raspberries or blackberries for a whole year, and then slowly, second, third, fourth year, they'll come back on strong as they were before you moved them. But long term, the garden will be better and healthier because of these moves, but they're not something that, you know, you their heart. <laughs> yeah. And and to to add to the spinach in the greenhouse this year because it's a bit slower than other years, I've planted in some of my tiny soil blocks uh a bunch of different uh more spinach and more mustard greens, so I'm hoping that maybe if I'm germinating those inside, I can bring them outside and they can just take off. And I'm even growing those soil blocks in a cooler area so they don't get used to the warm temperatures. So what what's a soil block so exactly? The soil blocker. So I spent a lot of uh, time this winter researching different methods of starting seeds uh, because I had been using what I'll call cell trays. So basically like you have a, what's called a 10, 20 tray. It's 10 inches by 20, 20 inches. It's like a plastic tray that you carry plants around in that you see at uh, a nursery or a greenhouse or a farm. And you can buy inserts for those that have like little plastic plugs. So you fill those with soil and you put your seeds in those um, kind of like if you bought like a pack of, say, pansies at the hardware store. That black plastic stuff. The black stuff. plasticky stuff. So you can buy different ones that are good quality and that will last a long time. But the ones I bought were sort of medium quality and they started to fall apart. And I'm kind of not that into them for that reason. I found they, they broke and I found it was hard to get the plants out of them without disturbing the roots. So even when I followed the tips that I had where you water them really well first and then you take like a fork or like a small little implement and scoop them out carefully, once the roots had grown and they were really root bound in there, I found it really hard to pull them out in one piece. And so then what happens if you put a plant into the ground and you disturb its roots too much, it goes through what's called transplant shock. So even if you've been spending time hardening it off really carefully, uh, it can still just basically sit in the ground and spend a lot of energy repairing its root system and then not grow the above ground parts, which is what you're looking for. You want it to start growing more leaves, to have a longer stem, to start flowering and fruiting within a you know reasonable amount of time. But it'll just focus on those roots for for uh, you know more energy than it needs. So. And the soil blocker somehow... Yeah, so the soil blocker is this neat little contraption that if you look Great, up... Great, another contraption? I know, another contraption. But if you look it up on YouTube, it's a little sort of like press. So you make your soil mix, and I've just been using Pro Mix, seed starting mix, uh, and you get it wetter than you usually would, and then you sort of press the soil blocker into it and compress it. And then it has a little spring where it pops them out. And then what you do is you just put those in the tray and then you plant the seeds directly into them. And so they're little soil cubes. They're little with soil no cubes. With no paper or plastic with around them. nothing around them. And they don't fall apart. No, I, I found that hard to believe. Watching videos of them, I was like, I can't believe that you can pick something like that up and it won't just disintegrate, but... The, something about the wetness of the soil and then also the compression of the soil block. Um, just it really works, works very well. Uh, it was really commonly done in Europe 
for a lot of years by market gardeners. And then Elliot Coleman, who's a famous organic grower from Maine, who wrote like the New Organic Grower uh, and a lot of famous uh, books in Four the Four Season Harvest. Four Season Harvest in the 90s. He went to France and discovered people using this contraption and got really excited about it. And there's a company that actually just manufactures them in England. So they're, you know, it was a hundred and. $20 to buy from Lee Valley to buy two soil blockers and a couple of little attachments for different size seeds. But I don't mind buying a tool like that that's going to last a long time. It's a metal tool. Exactly. Yeah. It has some plasticky bits. Yeah. But it's pretty robust looking. Yeah. And on the Master Gardener like Zoom call, I was uh, there was a woman who said she'd been using her soil blocker for 15 years still worked great. She still started all her seeds that way. So I felt like that was a pretty good endorsement of it. Uh, and a lot of people use it who are commercial growers, but then a lot of gardeners have been getting into using them. Because the great thing about them is that because it doesn't have any sides, the roots will grow through the, through the seed starting medium. And then when they get to the edge, they'll hit the air and they do what's called air pruning, which just basically means that they stop growing on their own because the roots don't want to grow through the air. Like they don't want to be exposed to the air. They want to stay where it's wet and where there's a soil medium to grow around. But then what they do is they'll start to branch. So instead of when you have a plant that starts wrapping around the plastic, you know, and it hits the wall and it just turns and sort of spirals through. And gets root bound. And gets root bound, yeah. Instead of that, it will just grow a thicker root system within the space that it has. And then what's the... Do you just take those and put those right in the garden, or then do you upplant those into pots? Depends what you're growing. You could do either. So you could upplant them into pots, or you could just plant them straight in the garden. Or some of the soil blocks, the smaller one I got, is only about the size of a sugar cube, and you can up-pot those into the bigger one. And the bigger one's about two inches square. And then you could up-pot those into, like, plastic four-inch nursery pots that I use that I collect every year. Um, but you could just put those straight in the garden too. So I'm, I don't know. I'm going to play, I'm playing around with them this year. I'm going to start all my seeds that way and see how it goes. Okay. And then what is the, what's the plan going forward in the next week? I guess, um, in Sackville, New Brunswick, where we are, we are getting ready to, we're planning a CD Saturday. Yeah. So that's going to be on Saturday, March 30th and it's at Ducks Aren't Real and that's at 19 Bridge Street, downtown Sackville, and it's just going to be a seed swap. So we're just inviting anybody to come out and bring some seeds that you have, bring some garden tips, meet other gardeners. Yeah, so drop some seeds off, take some seeds. If you don't have any seeds, that's generally okay. You can just take some seeds. Uh, there will be a $2 donation at the door for our local community garden. And next week, maybe we'll come onto the show with a list of other CD Saturdays that are happening in the region. Yeah, CD Saturdays are a great way to meet other gardeners and to get some uh, awesome local seeds for your garden. All right, and then I guess uh, we're also going to try to set up a hydroponic system this week yeah which we it's one of those things that happens all the time where you order something like five weeks ago thinking that you needed it right away and you would set it up eminently and then things get in the way and it's five weeks later but uh, there's still lots of opportunity to grow hydroponics this time of year so we'll do like basil and kale and things like that for the restaurant um, so we can have some great fresh stuff and we'll also be harvesting spinach from our greenhouse this week which will be really exciting and other than that i guess it's just more garden planning and putting those seeds into the what are they called again soil block 